Well, good afternoon, slave family. I am so thrilled to bring you our guest speaker today because I know that she is going to make a huge contribution to so many people. Unfortunately, it is one of those things where you don't want her help, but many, many of us need her help. And I'm thrilled to have her here today. So uh, joining us today is none other than Barbara Decker. And Barbara is a parent recovery advocate. And she's going to share a little bit about exactly what that means, what her personal background is, and the amazing impact she makes on families and parents. So, Barbara, first of all, thank you so much for being here. And your generosity and what you're doing is incredible. Can you fill everybody in on who you are and what you do, please? Sure. Um, so, I help primarily moms of adult children who have the disease of addiction, which includes alcoholism and or have mental illnesses. And we call all of that mind diseases and they all tend to co-mingle. And so when a parent, usually moms, a few brave dads, find themselves in that situation, they struggle to understand how to respond, what they can actually do to help. And unfortunately, most people do the opposite of what actually helps because it's very counterintuitive what's useful. And so that's the work I'm doing in the world right now. Um, and that came out of my son, Eric's eight years in addiction. He's now three and a half years in recovery. And uh, well, and to my delight, he's a technical person and he has a full-time job, but he spends his part-time hours freelancing for me and helping me with the tech. So oh, it's- That's amazing. Yeah, so he'll listen to some of the videos if he's doing a transcript for me or something, and he'll call me and say, mom, did I really do that? And I'll say, yep. Oh. <laughs> and we'll have a conversation about it. So it's, it's very nice, but for the time he was in the disease, my whole approach was, well, first of all, I couldn't imagine how this had happened to me. I tried really hard to be a good mom. You know, I did things with my kids. I set appropriate values. You know, we weren't, it wasn't like they were doing their thing and I was doing mine. We were all connected. And I really didn't have any idea how I could have gotten to this place. And to tell you the truth, before I ended up in this place, I was feeling pretty good. I was feeling like, you know, I had done a good job parenting my kids. We've got through all these they're both, you know, graduated high school. We don't have drugs. We don't have alcohol. We don't have any of these problems. And boy, wasn't I a good mom? And then, you know, the corollary to that is the judgment in my mind that if these things are going on in a family, it must be there's something underlying that allows it to happen. So I was terribly misinformed about what all of this means and the impact. And so when it hit me, it was... Um, it was just a full force effort to try to figure out where had I gone wrong? What had I done wrong? How had I allowed this to happen in my family and lots of guilt and shame and embarrassment and struggling and looking for those answers. And when I reflect back on all those years, then I would ask every doctor I came in contact with, everybody I you know, kept calling and reading and writing and I tried to pull every thread and I can see now when I look back that people were telling me all along that the person who has to change here is me, not that I can change him. And I wasn't ready to hear that. And no one that I encountered was able to tell me, well, exactly how do I have to change? Yeah, I'm not supposed to enable this, but what exactly does that mean? Uh, how do you put a boundary in place when someone has a mind disease? And so when I left my corporate job and tried to decide what I wanted to be in retirement as I grow up, you know, I decided I would see if I could build something that would plug those gaps that I thought existed for me, which was, okay, all of this might be true and I do need to change myself, but exactly how do I do that? And so I dug in and I built it, and I beta tested it and it works. And so here we are. Well, I think that there were so many incredibly important things that you just said in that little introduction. It's remarkable, you know, so let's take a minute and visit them because first and foremost, I think that it is really common, um, you know, and you and I chatted 
there is someone in one side of our family that has a problem with all of this. And it is really common to question yourself. And, you know, the last thing we want is a parent going through all this. And on top of the experience of they're having and the heartbreak they're having, they're going to beat themselves up or question themselves as a parent too. So it's really great that you shared that for starters. And then, you know, you did decide to branch out and do this program. And what were the things that drove you? Were you feeling like you didn't know where to go or you, you know, mentioned feeling maybe judged or that you used to not understand and judge people? What was the driving force? Because what you're doing is really making a difference for other parents, but going through something and then having the initiative to create and implement a program is a whole nother ball of wax. So would you be okay sharing with us what that compelling set of reasons was? Sure. So in the eight years that Eric was in his disease, um, one person that I relied on, a doctor who was very kind and would take my calls all hours of the day and night and over and over, I would call him and say, Dr. K, this is what happened now. This is this ridiculous thing that he did. And now what do I do? And he was very generous with his time and he talked to me, but I could get the sense after a while that I wasn't hearing what he was saying. What he was saying is, Barbara, go to this group, go to this group, go to this group. And so there was a group at a, a large um, clinical setting in, in my area led by a therapist who specialized in codependency. And so kicking and screaming, you know, I went to the group. I went so that Dr. K would keep talking to me. And I can picture my going to be the same way Eric would have gone to all the therapists I made him go to, or our kids would go to the AA meetings that we're forcing them to walk into, which is sitting here, I'm here, but you can't teach me anything and I don't really wanna be here and, and just physically present. And that's how I went, but I kept going back because I felt that I had to, to maintain this relationship that I valued with this professional. And over a period of time, what started to happen was my mind started to shift. I could hear other people telling their stories about what was going on in their life and maybe not in the moment that I heard the story, but later driving home or washing my hair or doing something else, I could see, even though I could say to them, here's what maybe you want to try to do differently, I hadn't connected those things to my own life. And so by going to that group and participating in it, I came to understand the things that I needed to do to get to peace, the things I needed to change in myself. And I made those changes. And so the answer to your question is maybe five years into Eric's addiction, I was still going to those groups, but I was at a place of peace. I really was. I would tell the stories about what was going on in Eric's life, but it wouldn't be uh, telling it, looking for somebody to tell me how to fix it. Just, oh my goodness, this is what he's done. And people would say to me, how are you peaceful about it? And that was the thing that inspired me to say, okay, why is it that I'm peaceful about it? What have I learned along the way? And is there some way to package that up in a way that's useful to other people? And so that's what was going through my head. Is there a way to take what I've learned and put it in a format that others could work through, other people who wanted a structured program? And that's what encouraged me to do it. So I started building it while Eric was still in the disease. I did ask his permission because I can't tell my story without telling his and I would never do sure. otherwise. And he gave his permission. Um, and before I ever launched it, he, he was in recovery, which was quite a, quite a surprise to me. I didn't think he was going to ever choose recovery, but he did. Did I answer your question? Absolutely. You did. And I'm just so happy to hear you keep saying he's in recovery. That's great. Yeah. So, you know, you, I think everybody's familiar with drug addiction and alcoholism because everybody knows somebody or has some kind of connection, but you did mention codependency and that that group taught you a lot of lessons, but I don't know if everybody is familiar with that term. So while we're involved in this conversation here, can you take a minute and explain what that is? I can try. It's a really hard topic to get your head around. And I've been saying it for a long time. And there are a lot of people who the word um, upsets them. They don't like the word. So codependency is different than interdependent. So we're interdependent on each other. Codependent, though, is when we're 
doing for someone else things they can and should be doing for themselves. And we're feeling negatively about it, where we're doing it out of obligation where we're doing it because we think that we should do it, where we're doing it in relationships where there's no reciprocity. If you picture your relationship with someone who has a mind disease of any kind, they take, 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 take. There yes. is no give, 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 give. And so we're codependent in that because we are, we are valuing ourselves through the prism of that other person's eyes we are feeling like we are not good enough we are not enough just as we are we have to do all these things to make ourselves have value to make ourselves seem okay to the rest of the people in the world those are some of the symptoms of codependency so when you move out of codependency you make decisions on what you're going to do based on what's right for you you take some time for self-care it's not selfish to take care of yourself you, you actually need to take care of yourself. Yes. So this is interesting because you learned a lot out of the codependency group that helped you through this whole process. You know, and I don't know the answer to this question. I'm just asking here to learn like everybody else. But do you think that a lot of people who have um, members of their family that are, you know, in the addiction or mental illness place, do you think a lot of them suffer from codependency? Is that common? Oh, it's very common. And I'll, I'll go further than that. Um, you're younger than I am, clearly, but the generation that I'm in, uh, and maybe your generation as well, I'm not sure, there's a cultural, a generational shift that occurred, in my view, somewhere along the way. If, we look, if I look back at my parents, life wasn't revolving around the kids. The kids were nurtured and loved and cared for, but they were the stars and the parents were like the sun and the moon. And my parents had their own relationship. And it was clear that that was the key relationship. And somewhere that shifted. And I don't know if it's people saying, I'm going to do a better job as a parent than my parents did as me. And it shifted to uh, what I heard recently called coddling. Uh, and, and I thought that was a pretty good word. And so I, I think that most women, certainly, and lots of men, are codependent because society almost expects us to be. They expect us to say yes. They expect us to be the caregivers. They expect us to be all of these things. So not just people who have loved ones in this disease, but it's much broader than that in my view. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And you know, it's really interesting what you're saying about the shift with parenting, because I do see so many people where the parents have no life anymore and it's all about all the stuff with the kids and you know they they don't have a personal life they don't have their relationship anymore that as, and look I'm not here to judge any parenting style but I really understand what you're saying and I think we we only have one child and we had him late so you know we kind of looked at all of that and watched what all the other families were going through and we navigated something that work for us. And again, I'm not in any way going to say our methods any better than anyone else, but you're so right. And now there are a lot of people who are in that generation where they're taking care of their parents and they're taking care of their, the parents and the kids that sandwich generation too. So you learned yeah. all of these things out of this program. And uh, fortunately, Eric is in recovery and you have this, let's talk about exactly what the services are that you provide. So let's say somebody's watching this and they say, I'm in that position and I would really love some help. What do you and your, what does your company provide to help people? So when I started, I provided only one thing. And that was a, the program is called the Transformative Boundaries Experience VIP Edition. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a structured eight week program where there are modules in a membership platform that open week by week. And there are emails that guide a person through doing that work. And then additionally, there is what's called a secret Facebook group. Nobody can even find it if they're not invited to it, uh, where coaching goes on every day. I coach and I have some graduate coaches as well, students who graduated and now work within the, within the business. Um, and there are live coaching calls each week, group coaching calls. So I coach twice a week live to anybody in that program. Oh, that's great. Plus, they have a small group progress call where we have a, two different options each week. And they're led by 
progress coaches, and their mission is to keep people on track week by week by week. They don't talk about the big picture things so much. They talk about what was your work this week? Don't tell me how you're feeling. Tell me what did you do your work this week? You know, that kind of thing. So that's the, that's where I started. And for anybody that can afford that approach, that is the well, I should say it this way, for anybody who can afford it and who doesn't mind being seen among other people as being in that situation, there are still many, many people who are so embarrassed that even if they know they're in a group of moms that are all in the same situation, do not want to be seen. So for people who find that that program out of reach or don't want to be seen by anybody, we have what we call the essential edition of that, which is less money and you get the same program and the emails, but no group or coaching. Okay. And then I have some smaller products as well that, that give, um, there's a jumpstart guide, which gives you kind of an overview of our philosophy and there's weekly insights videos. There are smaller, smaller offerings as well. It's really a shame how many people, even in that setting, would feel uncomfortable. And again, you know, I'm grateful that at this point in life, I have not had to have any experience like that with my son. I pray never do. But having other relatives and watching it and you see these people who are unbelievably great parents and they're not doing anything that would trigger their child to, you know, go on that path. But they do carry it as a guilt and mistake. So it's just lovely that you are creating places for people that go into their own comfort zone rather than have them avoid healing because it's not a way that they can see themselves doing it. All you have to do is look at most television shows, most movies, read books, walk down the street and watch how people react when they see people who are homeless or who may be using drugs and alcohol and Watch how the people who are using the substances are portrayed. They are portrayed as bad guys, and there is no understanding that this is a disease. Now, none of that means you excuse any of the behaviors that are so negative that come with this disease, but it is not the person, it is not the core of the person making these choices. Um, one doctor that I admire calls it a disease of free will. Another calls it a disease of volition. And mm -hmm. so once you have used the substance, and, and that includes, by the way, gambling addiction, sex addiction, eating disorders, once you are hooked and your brain chemistry has changed, it's not a choice like it is for you and me, assuming that you're not addicted and I'm not addicted. For yeah. me, it's a choice every time if I want to have a drink. When you're in this disease, it was described to me as your body has biological things that it needs. It needs food, it needs water, we need sex to procreate. And our brains are wired to send out signals to us, you need, you need, you need food, water, mm -hmm. sleep, sex. And those signals are a whisper. When you're addicted, the signal, you need drugs to survive, you need alcohol to survive, you need gambling to survive, comes out of the same part of the brain, except that it's a shout. Wow. So it is stronger and more powerful than anything else. So it's a hard disease to get out of. And yet it is so possible if the person decides that they want to. And that's that's the key. Yeah, that that is 100 percent the key, because, you know, they always say you can't address anything unless you address that you have this illness and you have this issue going on. So when you watch all of this and knowing what you know, and understanding the behavior and what's driving this, then you must see parents have common, you know, like you're saying, common reactions, common behaviors. Is there anything that if someone's watching this, this is their first realization that there's any kind of support system out there like what you have, can you give them a tip? Like here's one of the really big common mistakes that I see parents do. Sure, I could give you a couple. One is it's not your life, live your life. Let the person live theirs. Try not to be judgy of what they're doing and try to see that there's a person beneath the disease. Don't tolerate nonsense coming at you, but don't be the person who thinks that 
by suggesting, by talking, by putting information in front of them, you're going to be able to change their mind and convince them that they should make a change in their life. It doesn't work like that. They have a whole different view of reality. They really do think the world that we see is wrong. They believe what this disease is telling them. And so when you push at them to change their behavior, you achieve the opposite. They dig in more deeply. There's, there's a long conversation we could have about that. Number two is try to be kind and compassionate and nice, which doesn't mean accepting manipulation, bad behavior, uh, the guilt that they want to throw on you, the, I need it now, 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 I'm going to die if you don't give me $20. Don't accept any of that, but you don't have to be mean and nasty about it. You don't have to degrade them. The, there was a study done in Portugal who decriminalized all drugs like 20 years ago, and they had a lot of uh, focus groups study it. And one of the key things is that addicts need to be treated with dignity. And we don't do that. We demean them. In the, the, everywhere you look, we demean them. And number three is, think about it. What would make a person change? What makes you change? You only change if the pain of not changing, if the pain of not changing gets to be greater. So for an extreme example, child is living in the family house has a house, all the meals, his car, uh, phone, everything is provided by mom and dad who are trying not to abandon the child who has the disease. Well, there is no motivation at all for that person to change. That person has to feel their own pain to be able to make a, make a choice to change, which doesn't mean we say, throw them out of the house. Everybody makes their own choices. There are no right or wrong, but it means making a judgment about how far you are willing to go and whether what you're doing is helping the disease or helping your child. Oh, that's a great distinction. So essentially it's when the pain of change and the pain of staying the same, when the battle between those two shifts, that's what will drive the person. Yeah, and they call it, you know, hitting your bottom. And that's, a lot of people don't like that term. A lot of people who are re in recovery don't like that term. and. It's remarkable because hitting your bottom means very different things to different people. Somebody can be homeless for years and years and years and have lost their child and it's not painful enough for them to want to change. Other people, as soon as they have no place to live now, it's painful enough for them to want to change. But I use the example, it's a ridiculous example, but I like ice cream. I had a real problem during COVID because nobody could see me from the waist down. And so there was very little motivation for me not to eat ice cream. Now COVID ends, now my pain is, I have to put on pants that button at the waist. I have to put jeans on my body. Now the pain of continuing to eat ice cream every day is manifest in my life. But without that, really, I, I've had very little motivation not to eat ice cream. And if I think about how hard it is for me to stop eating ice cream, now think about how hard it is for someone to choose to make a change out of the disease of addiction when it means changing every single thing about their life. Mm. Even their reality changes, you know, I mean, every single thing about their life, it is amazing. And I've, I've had a few friends that were addicts that went through recovery and they just said that the whole world looked different to them. Yeah. So it's, it's remarkable. Now, I know that you have been providing these services, and of course, you have the different groups that you've talked about attached to it. You know, moving forward, as you continue to help families with this, do you have other plans to add services or expand in any way or get your message out there through a different platform? What is your vision as you continue to grow this? So right now, I'm only advertising on Facebook, and I have to change that. Um, I have to add some other platforms. And I hope to be doing that next year. Everything takes a toll. It all takes time. Yes. But beyond that, um, more importantly, when the revenue supports it, and I think it will for next year, I want to hire somebody who will approach rehabs and public sector agencies that work off of grants hmm. and make the case for putting the essential edition version, the part without the support, 
into rehabs as their family program, putting oh, it in that's great. the public sector, training people who can teach it in the public sector to people who can't afford to actually enroll in, in the program. And it takes a different kind of, it takes a special kind of person to want to go to all those events and meet all those people and make those connections. It's not me. Yes. Uh, so I have to hire someone. And it takes a different kind of mindset to teach the people that the public sector would be working with because the people that join my program generally have enough to eat. They have a place to live. They're not scrambling day to day to pay the bills. It's a stretch sometimes, but there are a lot of people that need this who don't have any mental energy sure. beyond what it takes to survive. And I'd like someone to pick this up and deliver it in a way that it can help that group of people as well. That's fantastic. Well, I'm so grateful that you're in here and uh, sharing with everybody what you're doing. Uh, so we want to leave some people with ways that they can find out more about your company and your services. So I know there are two places people watch this. Some of you are watching this today live in the Facebook group, and some of you will be watching this on our YouTube channel. So uh, first things first, I know that I am particularly horrible at Facebook Messenger, and I know that's not your thing either. So if somebody does want to reach you um, and they want to find out more about your company and services, can you tell them what's the best way to find you, please? Yes. If you want to just look at what I do, my website is www.livewellandfully.com. If you have a question or you want to reach out, the email is support at livewellandfully.com and you'll get a response. Perfect. And we'll post that below the interview on both YouTube and Facebook, but Facebook Messenger is not the way to get her. So she's nope. committed to helping people. We don't want you to send her a message and then think she just ignored you. That's definitely not what we're playing for. Well, we here. have an autoresponder there now if it's working that says, we don't engage on Facebook Messenger. Please email support at livewellandfully.com. We have a boundary, you Perfect. see. We have a very clear boundary. <laughs> Well, that, that makes sense since you are the queen of boundaries. Now, if you're watching this in the Facebook group, you can post questions though below this interview. And Barbara was kind enough to say that, you know, she would interact in the group. So if you want to post comments also on the YouTube channel, when you see this, she will go back and comment that way. So you can reach her either through the comment section of how this is posted or directly through the site. Right. And if you post a comment, put at Barbara Decker. Yes. Yes, please do. <laughs> or I won't see it. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Barbara, thank you for your time and your commitment and the difference that you're making for families. It is a true gift to people who are struggling with this to have someone like you, you know, a guide and not just someone who is doing it from an intellectual standpoint, but someone who's doing it having lived it. That's all the difference in the world. Yes. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's been a pleasure to be here and keep doing the good work that you're doing, Leah. Oh, thank you. Bless your heart. You are just amazing. So there you have it, Barbara Decker and check the comments below, leave comments or questions for her, please. And we will see you all next week. Take care. Bye.